Now, to set the big picture, uh, the overall of our topic, global mental well-being, we have invited two keynote speakers. And it's with great honor that I now introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Lydia Lasseri. She is the regional advisor for mental health at the WHO Regional Office for Europe since May this year. She's native in, of Albania, lived in Turkey and in several other European countries, now moved from Hungary uh, to live in Denmark, so a true European. In her function as a regional advisor, she leads a team that brings together expertise in various areas such as policy and service, uh, rights and advocacy, communication and promotion in mental health. Please welcome Dr. Lydia Lassery. The screen is yours, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers. Thank you, Sana, for inviting me. And, uh, and I'm deeply honored to be here today with such a, at uh, Uppsala Health Summit. Um, honored by the, the hosts, but also by the, such a um, uh, diverse um, the participation. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, my presentation and I hope the, the words of the vice uh, chancellor will be echoed by what I'm going to say here, both in terms of findings, but also in terms of uh, way ahead. So um, I'm going to talk here about the mental health impacts of COVID-19 in the WHO European region. I know that with uh, such a, a global audience, you would be, of course, interested to, to, to hear more about the, the rest of the world. But I'm sure that the diversity of the European region uh, that starts from the, the Iceland and Sweden in the West to Kyrgyzstan and, and Russia in the East, and from uh, Finland uh, to the north, to Israel and Turkey uh, to the south. So it's a hugely diverse region. And I hope the diversity of the WHO European region can somehow uh, reflect also the diversity of a lot of um, uh, global uh, scenes. Uh, what I'm going to talk is about uh, is evidence that has been built by a WHO technical advisory group during uh, 2021. It consists of um, knowledge that has, has come from all over the world, and it also uh, consists of uh, recommendations that have now been uh, factored in the new WHO European Framework for Action on Mental Health that I will briefly speak uh, in a few minutes. Uh, now, uh, an overview, what I'm going to talk now is um, uh, briefly uh, uh, summarize how was mental health before the pandemic, what was the impact of the pandemic, what is needed, and last but not least, recommendations. So when it comes to mental health before the pandemic, 16% uh, 60, of the population in Europe suffer from a mental disorder. Most common mental disorders are depression and anxiety. Almost a fifth of non-fatal disease burden in European region, in WHO European region, are attributable to mental health conditions. Mental disorders are disorders of the working age, and therefore uh, the economic burden of uh, mental disorders is hugely felt in every economy of the planet. And in the European Union alone, the costs are estimated to be 600 billion euros per year, uh, or estimated to more or less to an average of 4.1% of the GDP of the European Union countries alone until a couple of years uh, before the pandemic. And of course, this is the, uh, the, the, the costs are mostly in production losses. Now, uh, what happened before the pandemic? Where were we in terms of prevention and treatment? We had a low uptake of treatment, 7 to 25 to 28% for common mental disorders, depending on income level. There was a lower availability of interventions aimed at prevention and strengthening resilience. And the pandemic has made it clear that mental health problems can affect everyone and that everyone is vulnerable for developing a mental disorder. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say with this, uh, this slide is that we already had a treatment gap because of numerous reasons, either because of uh, income level or because of uh, the uh, barriers like stigma, uh, literacy, etc. And on top of that, the pandemic has made it clear that we can all be affected by uh, mental health uh, conditions. 
What happened when we try to see the timeline of the pan, of the of the, of the pandemic? Uh, the uh, mental, the key mental health effects of the pandemic are as as uh, shown in this table. The first and the strongest uh, effect was the immediate fear and response to lockdown. A lot of countries in the European region, but not only, were uh, subjected to strict lockdowns, and the response to that was immediate fear. Later on, and with lower intensity, but still uh, a very much felt and strong, was the immediate response to pandemic adversities. And the pandemic adversities are not only the loss of life and the, um, and the severe disease, but it's also a social effects like loss of employment and uh, we mentioned lockdowns, isolation, lo uh, loss of school um, uh, exchange for uh, children and young people, etc. And then we had um, um, all along insufficient mental health support. You see the, the, the need for mental health support became obvious nearly from the beginning and it became uh, it in, uh, the, the awareness about that intensified with time. So there was a moment in the pandemic when it was so painfully obvious that the mental health support available for our citizens was totally insufficient. And then the, 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 on, on the longer run, we had the long-term consequences such as unrest, poverty, uh, re economic recession, and so on. Now, when it comes to impact of the pandemic on mental health, um, mental disorders, as I mentioned, were already a big public health challenge before the pandemic. The, the full impact of the pandemic on mental health is not yet clear. We have probably, we are encountering a small increase at the population level, However, we see the increase of risk factors to mental health conditions, such as inequality, employment, isolation and loneliness, child adversities, violence, lack of schooling, unhealthy lifestyles. Um, more evidence is coming as we speak on each and every one of those risk factors. And you, uh, the, the audience is surely aware about, for instance, increasing of domestic violence due to the pandemic and so on. Uh, there is evidence also about increased consumption of alcohol um, and, and more, but uh, if we had more, I'm sure that in the summit um, more evidence will come to light. Um, a large impact was felt on high-risk groups, and I'll talk in a minute about that. There was an impact on public mental health services globally, but also in our region. There is a report, uh, an alarming reporting of disruption of mental health services. 39% uh, of the 50 of the countries in the European uh, region, 53 member states, 53 countries, so 39% of those reported severe disruption of uh, mental health services. And there are countries which, uh, for instance, um, institutions, uh, a residential care for people with mental disorders and um, learning disabilities were converted into COVID hospitals. So there was a, an abrupt disruption and discontinuation of a level of, of care that the citizens were previously used to receive. Um, and last but not least, the impact on the health and social care workforce. And we have had alarming uh, demands from the healthcare workforce, especially those in the, in the, in the front line, that in the, after a few weeks since the, the start of the pandemic, reported a high burnout among, uh, among their um, ambulance service um, workers, for instance, due to the overwhelming conditions they were subjected to. Uh, now, which are the specific high-risk groups? And I'm sure you are aware of those, but I want to highlight this here that the pandemic either intensified already known vulnerabilities or created new ones. For instance, migrant and refugee populations were already a, a group at high risk for obvious reasons, but we saw now how uh, because of the, the um, uh, disruption of services, because of the, um, the huge um, burden on the uh, employment level, migrant and refugee populations were among the most affected ones. Health and social care workers, I just spoke about that. Children, adolescents, of course, due to the, um, to, to the school closures and lockdowns, children, adolescents were subjected to an unprecedented level of uh, isolation that uh, will probably hamper the, the normal development that we expect in, uh, for their generation. 
We had newly unemployed workers, the pandemic and the economic burden associated to that produced um, large uh, numbers of unemployed workers, which were now uh, the new high risk groups. Older adults confined to their place of residence and here, um, further we go in the Western Europe, more uh, people, we have more older adults we have living in uh, institutions and they were subjected to extreme isolation, but also uh, uh, people that were living in their homes, not so, not, in, not in, 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 in care homes, living in their homes were also uh, confined and subjected to extreme isolation. And last but not least, again, people with pre-existing mental health conditions conditions and people with psychosocial, cognitive and intellectual disabilities were um, at higher risk for not only for having a worsened mental health impact, but uh, worsened mental health because of that, but also uh, being subjected to increased risk of infection and therefore of, of fatal uh, outcomes. So what is needed? Uh, there were uh, four areas uh, for which recommendations were formulated. The first area was mental health impacts and needs related to the general population and communities. The second was groups, so vulnerable groups that we mentioned that were particularly affected by the mental health impacts of COVID-19. The third was on impacts on mental health services. And the fourth was the mental health impacts of COVID-19 on the health and social care workforce. And the more in details, the recommendations that we uh, focused on that, that were drawn up on this work was the first recommendation that countries should promote and enable access to culturally adapted evidence-based interventions for mental health and psychosocial support through digital and other means, including interventions to increase the resilience and help people cope with stress and loneliness. And this is a very dense recommendation. There are so many things uh, within that. Uh, I would like to pick up the fact that through the pandemic, we learned uh, how much we can expand access to services through digitalized solutions. And um, we focus on having evidence-based um, and culturally adapted interventions because the pandemic, uh, 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 due to the isolation and due to the difficulties people have to access care, this care needs to be particularly tailored and adapted to their setting. The second uh, intervention is countries should promote support and embed psychological support initiatives in the workplace and provide occupational and financial support to those prevented from or not working or in the process of returning to work. As I mentioned, a new group of uh, high risk is the newly unemployed. These people have either um, are either trying to return to work or are uh, struggling to find another, another job. And of course, this is a group that needs to be supported in the workplace and provided uh, um, other assistance, either occupational or financial one. A third recommendation is that countries should address the social determinants of mental health, including poverty, unemployment, and social economic inequalities through targeted actions to provide financial support to households uh, at risk of impoverishment, um, including sickness access payments for those temporarily unable to work. So what this means is, and I think the vice chancellor briefly touched upon uh, on the social determinants and um, the pandemic taught us for, for those of us who had previously been unaware of the, the importance of social determinants to mental health. And this recommendation is about precisely that, focusing on a broader uh, spectrum of conditions rather than simply the health status of individuals and of groups of populations. And the fourth recommendation in this, um, in this area is uh, monitoring. So monitor changes in mental health at population level through valid standardized and comparable measures and instruments so that we can not only measure what we have done, but we also can inform the future actions and, and um, initiatives. Now, the second area that I mentioned, the second group is groups particularly affected by the mental health impacts of COVID-19. And this recommendation concerns uh, is, is about countries 
to promote, communicate, and increase access to social and emotional learning, to educational support for learning loss and mental health and psychosocial support in schools and universities, and provide more community support for adolescents and young adults. And I'm sure my colleague from UNICEF will have, will have more uh, to, to, to say on this. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that everyone in this room, in this uh, forum here is uh, acutely aware of the loss that several generations of students have uh, encountered so far and will suffer the, and which impacts they will suffer for the years to come. The uh, second recommendation in this group is about promoting and enabling access to mental health and psychosocial support for individuals directly affected by COVID-19 disease. We talk here about long COVID. It's a devastating condition, not only because of the um, um, great impact on physical health, but also of the uh, great impact on mental health of people who have lost their ability to be productive members of society, to be active members of their families and social network. Uh, and the third recommendation here is countries to develop, communicate, and put in place emergency preparedness guidance for people with disabilities and, and in long-term care, and to ensure continued access to, and, uh, to quality care and support. So that um, it's about that particular group that was already um, vulnerable because of disability and because of a placement in uh, long-term care. Uh, so it's tailoring um, uh, packages of support to this particular group. Now, when it comes to mental health services, uh, the first recommendation here regards uh, the need to strengthen and develop mental health and psychosocial support services as an integral component of preparedness and response and recovery from COVID-19 and other public health emergencies. In other words, what we learned during this pandemic is that while countries were struggling to secure PPEs, personal protective equipment at the very beginning. They were struggling in the race for vaccine or for, for medication and for treatment. And, and uh, there were a lot of questions about remdesivir, yes and no, dexamethasone, yes and no, hydrochlor hydrochloroquine, yes and no. So while all, were, um, all of us were involved and in, um, in the race for life-saving measures, we, uh, the lesson learned here that is that next time we need to involve mental health um, support from day one of the response of, to a pandemic or to another emergency. Uh, so a mental health should be an integral part of, um, of the emergency uh, packages. Next recommendation here is to ensure that mental health services are legally, operationally, and financially safeguarded, and uh, that uh, to, to oversee scaled up provision of person-centered community-based services that include innovative modalities of care. In other words here, uh, it, this, this it, it reflects the awareness that one of the reasons why no country was prepared to provide mental health support to, um, amidst the pandemic is that mental health is chronic, has been chronically underfunded, underprioritized, under-resourced. So on top of, of a system that has been inadequate for so long, a pandemic hit. And that means that, and that, that teaches us, that requires that the next planning for mental health services should be to, to, to secure sound financing, sound resources, a sound legal frameworks within which they operate and within each which they are safe from crises like a pandemic or other emergencies, either natural disasters or man-made conflicts. And the last uh, area here is mental health impacts of COVID-19 on the health and social care uh, workforce. Uh, and it's about ensuring safe, fair, and supportive working conditions for frontline health and care workers, including provision of appropriate protective equipment, revised pay and conditions, and access to mental health and psychosocial training and support. All of us here are aware how many uh, health workers chose to, um, to quit, to separate from service, because they felt inadequately uh, protected, either physically, because you remember the struggles in the beginning of the pandemic with uh, insufficient um, protective equipment supplies, or uh, mentally, 
because there was hardly any uh, mental health assistance to the frontline uh, workers. And this recommendation is about uh, that uh, particularly. And last recommendation in the whole bunch of recommendations is about providing mental health workers and frontline responders with uh, capacity building opportunities and training in preparedness and response to infectious disease and other public health emergencies, basic psychosocial skills and other tools to mitigate the psychological impacts of COVID-19, both for their clients and themselves. We are all still pained of evidence how of the about our colleagues, healthcare workers, that were the only ones to say goodbyes to dying people from COVID-19. That has taken a tremendous toll on mental health of those people, of, of their families, and it is one of the reasons for the extreme burnout that uh, those um, uh, health workers uh, have been subjected to. And this recommendation is about equipping them with knowledge, giving them capacities so that they can take care of them themselves, but also of others that they, they are um, um, entrusted to look after. So um, the key message is here. Um, mental health was already a big problem, problem before the pandemic. As I mentioned, mental health, uh, the, the burden of mental health is high. Mental health has, however, been under-prioritized, under-resourced, under-funded. And uh, the pandemic has increased the problems probably a little on the population level, but much more for specific target groups, and that everyone has been vulnerable for mental health problems, as we learned, um, obviously. Measures are needed to strengthen public mental health, including prevention and resilience building, and I was very happy to hear the Vice Chancellor to talk about resilience. Take, uh, the need, there is a need to take specific measures for high-risk groups, to strengthen mental health care and to respond to the mental health needs of the health and social uh, workforce. Now, all those lessons learned, and I have two more slides and I'm done, all those lessons learned were reflected in the European Framework for Action on Mental Health 2021-2025. Uh, it was just endorsed by the Regional Committee, which is the annual meeting of Ministers of Health of the WHO European Region, and it has three uh, main uh, strategic objectives. One is the mental health service transformation, and you can see the, the, main, the, the, um, the, the issues within, not the issues, but the actions foreseen within each of uh, each pillar. The second pillar, as I mentioned already, is the integration of mental, of mental health into emergency preparedness, uh, response, and recovery. And the third pillar is mental health promotion and protection over the life course. And here it's, um, it's about um, improving resilience and improving and enabling communities for better uh, health and well-being on the longer run. And here, as you see in the third uh, pillar, the priorities are children, adolescents, and younger people, older adults, mental health in the workplace, and of course, suicide prevention. And the last uh, here um, is uh, the, the instrument, the vehicle that we in WHO Europe are now looking forward to, uh, to use as for the implementation of the framework for action is the Pan-European Coalition for Mental Health. It was launched only two weeks ago in Brussels, and um, it, it convenes uh, together representatives of governments of our member states, um, experts, WHO collaborating centers, um, uh, organizations, non-state actors like um, um, NGOs, that uh, work in advocacy, in uh, users' involvement, in family um, um, empowerment, and um, not, not excluding private sector, employment organizations, employment and labor organizations, and, and universities, of course, they would go with the experts. Uh, so the European coalition uh, is having three is focusing on three priority initiatives, as I mentioned, children, adolescents, young people, older adults, mental health data lab, a word here, we are working to improve data, not only data collection, but also data analysis and utilization in the area of mental health, so that action in mental health across the WHO European region is, um, is measurable and it informs policies and actions. Um, we also hope to develop a leadership uh, a package 
uh, that includes a peer support structure and a forum like this one would be uh, an ideal example of uh, how peer support can take place. And uh, again, not the least, research and innovation, including digital technologies, which I briefly mentioned across my presentation. Um, the, the diagram on the, on the right is the, how the, the, the mental health coalition will be um, functioning. You see the three pillars are the, the three pillars of work are the three um, areas of work. And we have the smaller uh, circles are the actors, civil society, government, international organizations, and uh, including, for instance, UNICEF. We have here our UNICEF colleague here and mental health experts like many in this room. And and the way how uh, these actors will work to achieve uh, objectives set by the pillars are through data, through advocacy, through literacy, through leadership. Uh, this is uh, my presentation. I hope I have been clear, but I'm happy to take any question if it arises. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lydia. Um, thank you so much, Lydia. And um, we do have two questions for you. Uh, when it comes to data, you, you talk a lot about data and you often hear that it's difficult to assess mental health in a population and maybe that the data is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but we have a question here. How can countries be better at gathering evidence-based data to understand the true burden of mental health? You talk a little bit about this, but what can each country do to be better, to do this better? That, that is a, a, a very um, interesting question that <laughs> requires a bit of a, of a more elaborated answer. In a nutshell, one of the problems we encounter in WHO is that um, countries collect data as uh, very often using different methodologies uh, and, and also while having different capacities. When I mean different capacities, it's not only about how much the person that collect data knows, but it's also about governance of data uh, collection, like uh, where who collects the data? Is it the Institute of Statistics? Is it the Ministry of Health? Is it academia? Who collects the data that then become, and where is data, which institution is the data repository? And countries are different from one to another, and the way how countries also interlink data is different from one country to another. Very often, like the, the um, uh, uh, data that is, uh, is brought in WHO because of the differences in countries' um, systems, uh, the data collection systems, uh, have problems in comparability, and which which adds another layer of complexity of what we collect. So, what uh, what we mean by uh, developing this data, mental health data lab? First of all, we want to focus both on the uh, mental health status of the population, but also on the mental health system performance, because um, we can't expect mental health uh, a mental health status of the population to improve unless we are able to measure the performance of mental health systems, including the governance of mental health systems. There are countries who have that have very, very decentralized um, health, health uh, care delivery, or there are countries who have very centralized health care delivery, which means that not only uh, data are collected differently, but also the way how they approach the population is very different. So uh, the, the data, the mental health data lab needs to capture that and to acknowledge that and to factor that in when data are analyzed and and uh, and and used as evidence to inform policies so data cannot be blind numbers they need to be not only collected but they need to be they need to be analyzed uh, properly so that they, they they make sense to the countries when they when data go back to countries when we expect policymakers to use the data that have been produced by W or other actors, UN, international organization, academia, the data need to make sense because they need to be contextualized. But for that, we first need to capture contextualized um, situation, to, to capture the contextualization of data collection and analysis in order to then move forward. Mm. 
I see. So it, it had been so much easier for you if everything was you know, streamlined and you got the exact the same data from, from the exact same place from the different countries. But I understand that that's not possible, of course. Now, the, the next question is uh, uh, maybe related to this one. How does the WHO approach various terminologies or use of broader terms like mental ill health uh, within public mental health? That is another uh, very good question. And I am afraid I do not have um, a standardized answer for that. And there is the, the main reason for that stays again in the diversity of our um, of the situations we operate in. For instance, um, community mental health care might mean something in a part of the WHO region uh, of, of WHO European region, and might mean something slightly different in another part. In some parts of the region, community mental health might mean simply a psychiatrist prescribing uh, medication with a nurse in uh, in witness in a a outpatient setting. In another country, um, it might mean a far more complex community mental health team that is equipped of a, a, a big number of multidisciplinary, of interdisciplinary uh, experts that do different parts of the work, either like assertive outreach, home care, um, diagnosis, um, testing, and so on and so forth. So. Um, the need to um, standardize the terminology is not only into mental ill health, but also we need to have a, a glossary of the accepted um, notions about, for instance, care or about a social worker. Will it be a so social worker? Will it be someone that has a diploma of social work? Or will it be someone that has been put ad hoc to perform social work uh, functions, but doesn't have the the, the the um, education for that. And now for some uh, people in this room, it might seem strange that a social worker is someone that is not graduated in, in social work, but there are parts in our region where social workers are people who are doing the work on an ad hoc basis because they have been asked to perform that function, but they haven't been qualified to do that. So um, the, uh, the question about uh, terminology goes um, deep, beyond the, uh, the, the uh, glossary aspect goes to the reality of mental health systems and services in our region and to the, to the diversities of, of mental health ser uh, systems and services and governance in, in, in our region. And when I'm, saying, when I'm saying region, I'm aware that it goes beyond the WHO European region. It goes also to other uh, WHO regions as well. Mm. Thank you. So, so it's challenges with, uh, with, with different cultures, uh, different systems and structures and language <laughs> and lots of, yeah. It's certainly, and, and the last bef before uh, I, I hand over to you, it's, um, I, I want to highlight the fact that just before, uh, I mentioned a bit that uh, the pandemic highlighted how inadequately mental health has been um, funded across the world, the global, mental health is the global south, let's say. When we talk about geopolitics, we have the global north and the global south. And mental health in the, in the whole health arena has been the global south south and because of not only because of stigma and discrimination and illiteracy uh, but as uh, also very importantly because of under prioritization under funding under resources under resourcing mental health has been chronically left in the shadows so time is to bring mental health out of the shadows and to take real meaningful action with involvement of everybody. Mental health cannot be simply the task of mental health specialists or a mental health director in a given ministry of health. It is the, uh, the, the, uh, a business for the whole of society, as I was delighted to hear the vice chancellor starting his speech about. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, very much in agreement with you. Thank you, thank you. So this summit is very important then, uh, as, as I understand you. Thank you so much, Lydia.